count. A healthy alligator would normally thrash around at this point. After all, it just had a two-inch barb stabbed into its neck. But this animal hardly seems to notice. They showed very lethargic behavior. They didn't try and avoid the boat as we approached them, which is very unusual for wild alligators, particularly on Lake Griffin, and they put up very little fight. But still, the team takes no chances. They secure the alligator's jaws before bringing it on board. This is a zombie alligator, and no one can tell just what it will do next. The investigators follow protocol. They place tape over the eyes and jaws to keep the alligator subdued. Because what they have to do next is really tricky. The scientists attempt to take a blood sample from behind the alligator's head. They insert a syringe deep into the alligator's skin. into the cervical sinus of the spinal vein, where there are greater amounts of blood. The alligator corpses haven't revealed anything new to investigators, but the blood sample of a live animal may offer clues to their unusual behavior. These precious 20 milliliters of blood could reveal the identity of the killer. FGFC. The samples are marked for identification and then taken away for examination. Blood is the body's first line of defense against disease. Many infections will show up here first. Mark Merchant of McNeese University in Louisiana is an expert on alligator blood, and he's conducting tests on its resistance to disease and infection. We grew these microorganisms in culture in our laboratory, and we would challenge them with different amounts of alligator blood products to test what the effects were. Merchant laces blood with bacteria and viruses to observe the reactions of the alligator's immune system. What we found uh, was amazing. We found that uh, we tried 23 different types of bacteria, and the uh, alligator blood had uh, negative growth effects on all 23 types. The alligator blood kills all of the bacteria and viruses. Yet in some ways, this isn't surprising. Alligators are constantly battling with each other, inflicting massive injuries. Alligators can be extremely aggressive toward members of their own species. And sometimes during these fights, they uh, inflict serious injuries on one another, including loss of entire limbs. The resulting wounds are open to constant infection from the stagnant water, saliva, parasites, and foreign bodies. These enormous injuries heal most often without serious infection. They could never survive these sorts of encounters unless their bodies were extremely resistant to infection. Although Merchant and his team infect the blood with E. coli, salmonella, and strains of the bacteria that cause dysentery, none of the germs survive. The alligator blood behaves almost like a disinfectant, killing everything they throw at it. It even resists the HIV virus. Whatever's affecting the alligators, there's no sign of it in their blood. In fact, there are no significant differences between the blood sample from the zombie and the blood found in healthy gators. The investigators have drawn another blank. But they still have the live specimen they caught on the lake. That's where the team focuses its attention next. The zombie alligators drag their limbs as if they have no control over them, seemingly incapable of movement or thought. 
essential neurological messages from the brain might not be getting through to the alligators' bodies. Investigators decide to examine the central nervous system. Some of the signs that we saw did suggest some neurological problems, and that became our next suspect. First, the anesthetized animals are taken to the lab. Electrodes are inserted into the skin near major nerves. Using a series of small electrical charges, the scientists stimulate each nerve in turn. Healthy animals react predictably and rapidly by twitching the part of the body controlled by that particular nerve. But the reaction time of the zombie alligators is much, much slower and far more unpredictable. The team is definitely onto something. The problem is rooted in the alligator's central nervous systems. But what the problem is, they still have no idea. A year after the first mysterious alligator death in Florida's Lake Griffin, the mortality rate is 10 times greater than normal and still rising. Now there are too many bodies for the investigators to deal with. All they can do is mark them to show they've been counted and leave them to decay. It was a horrible sight out there to see some of the gators turned up. And they would come by and they'd spray paint them, paint them red, and that means that they'd had a count, a body count. But it was some awful big gators that died during this period. You know, a dead reptile, especially one that weighs a 1,000 pounds, is pretty smelly. The lake carries the stench of death. The fishing had become very bad at that particular point. Water quality was terrible. Uh, the odor was there not only from the dying carcasses of the gator, but just the, from the water itself. Seemingly in an effort to avoid the rancid water, some alligators struggle out of the lake, dragging their back legs behind them. But soon, they too will die. Woodward and his team remain mystified and frustrated. They decide there's only one place left to look inside the alligator's brain. Really, based on the observations of the biologists that had seen these animals alive, some of the, the clinical veterinarians that had done some of the tests, we knew that the brain was probably where we wanted to look. And uh, so we began to focus more and more on that tissue. The brain of an alligator is protected by tough skin and a thick skull. An alligator is a tough animal, and, and the skull on these animals is very thick. It takes some expertise and, and some special equipment to get into the brain. Not to mention brute force. But the operation is more delicate than it looks. For us to look at it under the microscope, the brain's got to be virtually intact. It's a very small piece of tissue, and really, we can't afford to damage it during the removal process. This tiny piece of tissue is the alligator's brain. Weighing just eight grams, it's no bigger than its eye. But this tiny organ could hold all the answers to this mystery. Once the brain is removed, 
the pathologists divide it into sections, distinct parts that they send away for processing. When we look at the brain with our eyes, we don't see anything. It's not until we have those molecular tests and those virus tests and the microscope that we can really start to make inroads into what's going on. Pathologists place tissue samples on a slide to be scrutinized under a high-powered microscope. These microscope slides contain a slice of brain tissue that is basically one five thousandth of a millimeter in thickness. So we're able actually to look at it at very high magnification. Light passes through the tissue, and what we see is really a sea of pink that is normal brain tissue. 